I'm, I'm Gareth Giles, I manage the public policy team at the university. Um, confusingly, I'm known as Giles to most people. Yeah, um, I answer to both names, but um, yeah, I, I'm Giles, basically. Um, so, I think this is kind of a slightly rehashed version, I mean refreshed and revised and ready for your attention today version of a presentation that I've done a couple of times. I think timing is probably going to be about an hour or so. Um, so we can have a bit of back and forth towards the end um, and maybe I'll let you escape early as well and you can have some time back in your diary. Um, so um, if I kick off with, um, this, this slide is provocative, but um, it, social media, like what's, what's the point of us doing this? What's the, well, what's the point of this, right? But also what's the point of us doing this as, uh, as researchers? Um, and I think that the, the thing that we're looking to do here is to go and find some people to advocate for your message. Um, and we, we can use social media to, to be able to do that effectively. Um, so um, we're kind of looking for laws here, uh, ways that we can uh, find something shiny and bright and exciting that we can get people to latch on to the work that you're doing and to be able to drive that out to a broader audience. Um, so we're going to start with some small fish and then we're going like, to... I don't, I'm not a, a, a maritime or marine scientist, so I'm not sure if this kind of fish eats uh, that kind of fish, but for the purposes of this, this is a slightly bigger fish, so work with me here. And then this is clearly a much bigger fish after that. So um, the idea is that we're going to do some work with the smaller fish to gain the bigger fish to get to the people that we really want, which is the great whites on the other side. Um, and the tools that we're going to use today to focus on are uh, Twitter, Instagram and, uh, and LinkedIn. Um, the people that we're going to be looking to get to are um, NGOs, third sector providers. This is kind of the best. Oh, this doesn't work. Um, the best image that I can get of political staffers, but like all very white. So that's 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 not ideal, really, in the scheme of things. Um, and a bit of media as well, right? So what we're looking to do here is make ourselves bigger to uh, to a, a different set of audiences, so that we can attract the attention of these people. These people, not hugely significant in and of themselves, but they will get us to the important people. So uh, the, uh, the civil servants of this world, great, again, old school Lumenshire. Um, clerks in particular of, uh, of committees, so these are the people that are feeding into the scrutiny process of legislation which is, uh, which is going through Parliament. Um, and, uh, and this symbol at the bottom here represents uh, the libraries, so um, both the House of Commons Library and uh, the House of Lords Library prepare presentations and documents for, uh, for, for members um, and uh, they will do this at a remarkably short turnaround on a variety of topics. If you are a parliamentarian and you ask for something you will get it. It's kind of like Google is now but for parliamentarians when they want something to be pr printed in a, in a nice format for them. Um, because of the turnaround time, for uh, uh, particularly for, for the libraries, they want to be able to get to people to be able to give them the answers to the questions that they've been posed by their, by their parliamentarians. Um, and if we have a, a strong uh, social media presence, um, then, uh, th then you're more likely to be seen, right? Um, and you're more likely to be asked to be able to give evidence towards these committees. In a summary of things that you need to do, there's going to be loads of this. And it's going to lead to some things where people actually get in contact with you. And then maybe you'll get to a Sir Humphrey somewhere along the lines who will say, ah, this is actually the thing which I really need and that I want to know more about. Um, but I want to prepare you that you're going to do loads and loads of this. And you're going to get some reward. And then you're going to get a little bit of reward, probably, further down the line. So... Um, Science communicator of, of our time, right, with that smiley, happy face, you know, things could only get better. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a bit of, um, a bit of theory here. So, um, with the, and, oh, and I should say as well, particularly for the, for the benefit of the tape, I am borrowing heavily from this book. These are uh, colleagues from, uh, from LSE, there'll be a link to this on the notes that go around. Um, it's awesome and has much more than I could uh, discuss in an hour and a half and in far greater detail than I could ever hope to do. Um, so linear model of communication, this is kind of like the old way of doing things and uh, this is talking about, you know, um, great scientists of our time gathers knowledge and information, organises this knowledge and information into a line to be able to go to uh, and, and particularly chooses the things that wants to be communicated and then starts to transmit that down 
and you see suddenly that the audiences have changed their opinion and, uh, and, and, and become informed and filled up like a vessel. And you know, there's a problem with that that it's quite spoon feedy. It's pretty paternalistic in terms of the decisions that are being made about what information is going to go out to people. Um, and it doesn't allow for any feedback. Um, and critically, social media gives us the ability to be able to have a dialogue with the people that we're looking to be able to tell uh, some, some information about. Um, there's, uh, there's the boss. Um, so, um, <laughs> moving away from a linear model of, uh, of communication, there's, there's something known as the convergence model. So, um, you can all read, so I won't read this to you, but the idea here is that we can start to bring things together with, uh, with other groups by actually facilitating some kind of dialogue. And uh, to be able to do that via social media is a, is a neat thing to be able to do. Um, it should inform your research in some way to be able to shape where your outputs will eventually be. Um, I spend a huge amount of time looking at pathways to impact statements and um, the, the thing which makes a pathways to impact statement much stronger is to be able to see that we're not just going to go out and do some research and tell some people about it by doing some Twitter. What we're actually going to do is talk to people about what it is that they might actually want from the work um, and then work with them to be able to shape that as part of the, the research process. Um, so here's kind of a, a, it's a, bit, of a bit of engagement. So um, uh, Director of Public Policy, um, uh, Gavin Coskin, at an event uh, last week, week before, um, sharing some information which, which is found um, in, a, in a presentation and then having some interaction with Guy Poppy, who some of you will know is a um, uh, Food Standards Agency uh, Chief Scientific uh, Advisor, uh, based at Southampton, but uh, in, in other places as well. Um, that there's a strengthening of, uh, of the work that you're doing if you can relate to other people and that you can converse in some way. Now, this maybe isn't going to be cast as being some kind of policy impact here, right, whatever that means, but um, this is a way of being able to open uh, a, a dialogue with others which could lead to, uh, lead to some policy impact. Um, so um, having a look here, um, social media can be involved in all parts of, uh, of your research life cycle um, and should be part of, uh, part of the mix that you're kind of probably doing a bit of this anyway. Um, and. Uh, and certainly this is something to, to be considering when you're writing your Pathways to Impact Statement about how you utilise these forms of technology. Um, so, uh, so impact is the, the, the <coughs> thing that we're looking to, to get to, but um, we can be engaged in, in each of these processes to be able to get to the impact. Um, so maybe some of the links that you're making, you're going to be doing a bit of WhatsApp directly with a closed group of people and you're going to have some kind of engagement there. Maybe you're looking for uh, participants for, for your study and you're going <coughs> to do a big push on, on Facebook to be able to do that and then start to have a, a community of interest and you want to push out some of your findings with, uh, uh, with Twitter. Um, we're going to look at, uh, at, three, at three platforms, um, so Twitter, LinkedIn and uh, Instagram this afternoon. Um, and the aim here, as I said, is to really grow your presence outside of this space and out there in the in the world um, like like the scary dinosaur I found a couple of pictures for this but this is kind of the least terrifying in in toy version but I mean you know that that dinosaur would be scary without the funny flap things but is even more so like that um, so you need you need content um, and it's uh, it, Content can kind of be a bit of a, a fear that you've got this thing that you should always be looking for content all of the time. Um, and in many ways, particularly if you're looking at Twitter as a, as a platform, by building up the people that you're following, you, they will be, you'll, you'll see their content. Um, and you can <coughs> steal that content and share that content out and you can just retweet it and you look to suddenly start to grow an audience of your own based on information that you are filtering out from a collection of other individuals. Um, think, thinking about what you're saying um, and who you're, who you're saying it to is, is kind of important and the, there are different tones and different uh, presentation techniques that you'll use for, for each platform. There's kind of a bit of a, a feel um, for, uh, which is different between LinkedIn, Twitter and um, Instagram. So somewhere to start with. Um, so I'm going to focus more 
on uh, on Twitter than than the other two, and that's primarily because that's a tool that we find is most useful uh, in the public policy team. Um, so. In your Pathways to Impact statement, you're saying things like, I'm going to be engaging with stakeholders. Um, and we would urge you to do a bit more work on, so who are these stakeholders? Maybe not the individuals, but certainly the organisations, and then the subsets of those, uh, of those organisations. Um, once you've identified them, go find them on Twitter. They almost certainly will have an account which is pushing out some information. Um, and, uh, and start to, uh, to, to build that into the people as your core group that you're that you're following. Um, have a look at who's following them. Um, so this is a great way of being able to develop the, uh, the people that you're, that you're following. Um, it will take you on some interesting and often uh, uh, journeys which will lead to a cul-de-sac, but there's a great way of being able to understand uh, ecosystems of people who are influencers by having a look at who the followers are. Throughout this process, you're also feeding the algorithms of Twitter to be able to tell them the things that you're interested in. Um, and going through that process, it will start to throw up options for you of other people uh, that you should also be, be interested in. We'll, we'll look at that a bit later on. Um, and by building this broad picture of people who are relevant in the area that you're interested in, you'll be able to start to see what things are getting retweeted and liked on a regular basis? What's the interesting stuff? What does good look like? So we've got some theories in the team of what good looks like. Um, we think that there's some stuff here around being able to have a big, strong visual image to be able to, one, fill up some space in people's timeline so you have that image there, to be able to have something which is engaging and provocative in terms of people's thought. Um, as something which is a relatively short call to action, um, so uh, as a, a marketing term like go, go do something, and the go do something will often be following the link which you've embedded into your tweet. So don't feel overly constrained by the whatever it is, two AT characters. Use this as an opportunity to be able to be that law, to be able to be the shiny thing that says, hey, look at this, this is fun and interesting. Have I piqued your attention? Click here to, to find out more. Um, so things about Twitter, it's an open network, which means that uh, people can uh, follow you without you giving permission for that to happen. Um, it's uh, it's fast moving, right? So uh, we, uh, well, I say we. Brexit is the thing, right, at the moment for everything. And uh, last week was a great example of uh, speculation, rumour, resignation, and, uh, and very little actual change. But all of that was covered in minute detail uh, in, in Twitter. Um, uh, you can be part of that dialogue and you can be part of that conversation, but that's a, a great example of a, of a news item working much faster on Twitter than it does in your, you know, waiting for uh, World at One or waiting for uh, PM or, or, or whatever for, um, uh, for your news coverage. So the, the dialogue is continuing much faster. Um, so I feel it's a bit snarky. Maybe it's the people that I follow. But, you know, a bit of, a bit of sass, shall we say? I don't know if anyone uses sass anymore, but, you know, a bit of sass. Um, there's, there's kind of a bit of, you know, twists all horrible and nasty and field patrols doing horrible things. I'm like, yeah, there's a bit of that, definitely. Um, and um, as, a, as, as a white male, I suppose, I, I don't get that much. Other people will get more. Um, you can block people, um, and this would kind of be a thing that I would choose to do. Um, uh, and you can also filter out the particular types of keywords so that you don't have to see all of that. So like, if you find that your Twitter is getting a bit nasty, there are barriers that you can, that you can put up. Um, and, uh, and I said the, the 280 characters, so um, do, do other stuff to, to get around that. Things that we find that we do quite a lot that may be useful for you in terms of, uh, of your Twitter account. Um, so. Uh, so images, right? Um, so if you're um, if you're taking a picture or you're uploading a picture, so this is from the uh, from the native uh, phone app as opposed to doing it on a desktop. But um, select your your image, um, and then there's a slightly cheesy picture of me there, and then you get this uh, this lovely button bit there. Um, if you press that, you can then choose from your uh, contacts list of people that you can uh, you can add into the picture. So some people are quite good, and some politicians are particularly like this, where they will go through their settings to not allow them to be tagged into pictures. The vast majority, the general melee of people, 
either not fussed about it or don't know that that's an option. This is a lovely way of being able to prompt people to say, hey, here's a thing that you should be interested in. So uh, we're fans of doing this particularly with other university corporate accounts. So uh, why waste characters out of your 280 with putting at uni Southampton? Why not just add them as one of the people that are in the picture and Johnny, who runs the, uh, the, the account, uh, will look at that and say, yeah, this is relevant or no, that's not relevant. But this is a nice way of just getting around the, the, the character limit. Um, and then it will appear somewhere like this with the names of the, um, <coughs> uh, of the people. From memory, I think it's it, is it eight people, Irina, that you can tag? I think it's eight, something like that, maybe half a dozen. But you can, again, you'd lose loads of space in your message if you were including all of those people. It would be real dry for your followers if you were to then do a tailored individual message to each of those people with their, with their at in there. Um, but you can bundle that all in and get that message across these people of, hey, here's a thing. Um, and that appears as a, as I say, a, a notification in here okay, uh, to say, look, you've been, you've been included in this picture. Um, so, um, so hashtags. Um, I, social media people seem to spend a huge, or certainly like social media marketing people, spend loads of time writing blogs about how many hashtags should you have and what's a good hashtag. It's quite dull, really. And uh, I think that uh, there's just some key points. Like, keep it short, because again, this focus on the characters, right? You don't want to have an enormously long thing when you could just have something which is kind of short. Try to avoid acronyms. I know in the academy we really love doing weird things with letters to try and make it short and make a thing, but it's, it's, all, it's all a bit naff and it's not really that memorable out there in the, in the real world. Um, and, um, and try and choose something which isn't used already. Um, so uh, to, uh, this isn't real. This is something that I was just having a little hunt around for and I was thinking about dinosaurs earlier on today. But um, like that's that's horrible. That's loads and loads of characters, and it's very accurate. That that is a or could be a, a thing, but much better to be able to have something which is nice and short and down, right, um, and kind of memorable. If you're doing a public event and you want to get people to start to include this, you really need to tell them that it's a thing. Um, so have it on your um, on your, your screen uh, when you're doing your presentations throughout. Um, have it in your printed stuff and tell people about it beforehand and uh, registration as well. Um, so, so yesterday I was at an uh, event at, um, at the British Academy and uh, there was a, a clerk from a uh, House of Commons uh, committee who was on the uh, registration list. Wanted to, to find this person, hadn't spoken to them before. Couldn't... The, by the time that I went into the room, not everyone had arrived. Other people filled in, didn't know if they were actually in the building or not. So I had a bit of a hunt around. Couldn't find them on, on LinkedIn. Uh, couldn't find them on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook to be able to see the actual person. Um, but did find a tweet which had their name and then this account by someone else who was a clerk at the House of Commons. And was kind of interested and thought, you know, that's worth a, worth a follow. And from there, um, this thing pops up in the corner of the, of the screen to say, well, what about other people that are kind of interested in this? So this is the algorithms looking at people that are communicating with each other on a regular basis and then throwing up those options as being things that you want to do. It takes loads and loads of, I mean, not legwork, but thumb work for you out of the equation and, that, and, uh, and some time saving. So I threw up this person um, and this person <coughs> And then this person who, who used to be in the House of Commons but um, runs a, uh, a, a pub now, a, a craft brewery in Whitstable. And I happen to have grown up near to Whitstable, so that's quite nice to know when I pop down and visit my parents next time. So I followed that and had a little look there. And then from there that threw up a few other people um, that I then went on and, and grabbed. Now, all of these people don't know them, probably you know, won't meet them for, for some time, but we've now grabbed those individuals because the algorithms threw up this opportunity. Eventually, it gets a bit confused, and it's now throwing up loads of different shops in Whitstable, which again, now Whitstable's a lovely place, right, but it's, it's tiny, and you can walk the high street and see all of these things, and you know, I know quite a few of these places. So then that kind of went into a bit of a, a cul-de-sac there, where it got confused and was thrown out by the craft brewery thing. So like, when you see these opportunities of looking at who it's suggesting as who to follow, and it is actually in the space that you're interested in. Go for it and follow as many of those people as possible. It will run out, but you know, use use that as an opportunity. So you get 
a bit of these kind of things going on. So like, we're, we're a bit involved in this. We did some stuff, was it last week that was UK Parliament Week? Was it last week? Yeah. yeah. So um, we do loads of stuff with Parliament on a regular basis. Um, Yurina, who does all of our super comm stuff, um, very quickly put together um, information about uh, all of the consultations that we've responded to as a university that have been supported by, by public policy and jumped onto the hashtag for the course of that week to be able to get things to be able to, uh, to say to our, the people that, w that follow us already, um, hey, this is stuff that we've been doing on this front. Because it's been uh, a popular hashtag, like, well, it's last week, so it's not listed there, um, that has then led to it being retweeted by, uh, by UK Parliament and others that have been featured on this hashtag and that we've had a, a little bump in terms of followers as well where people have gone, oh, Southampton doing interesting things. So look for these kind of opportunities where you think, well, you know, I've got that content already and maybe if I was just to put some tweets together during the course of the time, I could just make myself look that little bit bigger again. So um, moving on from, from Twitter. So, so Twitter's like really good for doing your uh, corporate stuff and it's pretty good for your research project as a whole as well. Um, it's quite good fun for you as, a, as an individual, although from experience, you know, leave your Twittering to a time when you don't have a glass of wine in front of you because disasters can happen and it's quite hard to row back, but you know. Um, LinkedIn is much more about your <coughs> you as an individual as opposed to your, your research project. I find it invaluable in my work to be able to, uh, to follow up with people by grabbing them on LinkedIn as well as sending them an email. So you've had a, you've had a, a chat with some colleagues and uh, you think, right, I want to be able to see other things that you're doing here. Being able to get into their LinkedIn profile is, is really useful. Um, Conferences in particular. So, like, you know, you've had a good conversation with someone and you've got a card or you've scribbled down a name and you haven't really got an ask that you want from that person, but, you know, you don't want to also just let them go and let them be a, a, a business card that collects dust in your, in your top drawer. Um, LinkedIn is a really nice way of just being able to grab hold of people, particularly for, um, for early career researchers, right? It's a really nice tool to be able to expand your network. It's not reliant on any one university system. It's not a spreadsheet somewhere that maybe you don't bring with you when you change employers. It's you and you building your personal uh, credence. Um, and for policymaking folk as well, right? So. Um, it may surprise you, it may not. Those of you that have had engagement with policymakers, probably less so, but um, people tend to move around in the policy realm really quickly. They're not necessarily specialists in their area, but they are good at doing policy, which is working with the, uh, being able to determine what are the right questions to ask in a timely manner and who it is that they need to ask. Um, so we have, um, we have lots of, uh, of policy fellows coming to, to the university for, uh, for visits and for meetings um, and we go up and we work with government departments on a regular basis. Now someone that we were in contact with previously doing a role for Department for Education let's say in 18 months time, two years time is probably likely to have moved on at the moment. Everyone is being sucked into the vortex of DEXU and some sort of scrabbling out of the Department for Exiting the EU, others not, not so much. Um, but this churn is really, really normal. So it's really, it's incredibly useful for you to be able to grab the individuals, not necessarily being that concerned about what their job title is at that time, because they will move, and when they move to somewhere else, you'll be able to see that they've moved to a new role, because you get a shiny alert from LinkedIn. And maybe suddenly in that role that they've moved to, they're far more relevant to you than they were previously. And that's your opportunity to refresh and go back to them. Um, if you've only made contact with them by an email, well, you're never going to know that they've moved to another job. Um, so yeah, that's a nice way of kind of uh, laying some alerts for yourself uh, that future you will be very pleased with. Um, and again, uh, so the algorithms throw up some, some fun stuff here as well. So um, I did my undergraduate degree here um, and uh, everyone on LinkedIn will, you know, it's, it's a bit of a jobs market thing, right? You want to always be kind of looking to, to, to show your, your best self. Um, everyone includes their, their educational history, which means that you can instantly collect, connect with an alumni network, which um, is very powerful and useful to be able to see people who are doing other things that were at the institution that you were at at some point. 
Um, I've got uh, a visitor coming on the 14th of December who is, uh, is a prime example of LinkedIn just doing some nice easy things for us. So. Um, uh, Professor uh, Baka Bahaj in the um, Energy and, uh, and Climate Change uh, Division in um, uh, Fells um, was interested in being able to get some more engagement with, uh, with Go Science. As I'm scrolling through doing a bit of general light updating of a bit of content for, for LinkedIn, it throws up this thing that there's somebody at Go Science who's uh, responsible for energy and uh, happens to be an alum of, of Southampton. You can send off a, uh, an invite to them to, to connect. It's a closed network, unlike um, uh, the, the other uh, Twitter that we were speaking about earlier. Um, and in a, in a bit of message there, you can personalise your invite. So I said, hey, this is what I do at the university. Maybe there's some interest here. We'd like to you know, see who we can speak to to be able to bring you down here or bring some people up to you. Um, so that's resulted in the visit that's going to happen a bit further down the line. Now, you know, I'm never going to know that person, and I'm not going to spend loads of time with the alumni uh, uh, people here to try and plunder all of that information for them. But there's a bit of serendipitous links which come up. Um, those links become more frequent the more people that you know, and that's a real impetus for you to be able to, to grow your network. The more that you feed the machine, the more it understands the things that you, uh, that you like and that you're interested in, and the more things that it will throw up to you. Um, so this is, this is all good for, for yourself. Um, so as I say, close network. Uh, a slower rate of interaction? It's really strange. The, the contrast between, uh, between Twitter and LinkedIn, it seems to be that maybe it's a bit of a, like a, a Sunday afternoon thing where people might be like, you know, they've had some time with their family, but frankly it's enough time now and it's the middle of the afternoon and you just want to kind of have a bit of a, a look ahead to, to your week and suddenly you'll see that those notifications that come in for LinkedIn that on a Monday to, to, uh, to Friday you just don't have the time to look at, you might have a bit of a, a flick through. Um, so weirdly I often find that there's stuff, that, content that I've put out which will then reappear um, and suddenly people will get warmed up to um, towards, towards the end of the week. So um, don't be upset if you see someone at a conference and then you send a LinkedIn thing to them and you don't hear anything for a week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever. Like, it's not you, it's the network. People just don't uh, engage with it in quite the same frequency. Um, and the analytics aren't great. Um, so particularly when you're thinking about how you uh, are accounting for your time, um, and the, the impact that you're <coughs> making from that, it's, it's a bit weak on that front. Twitter that we'll have a particular look at in terms of, uh, uh, of measurement at the end um, is much, much better at that. Um, however, you know, you're probably not reporting this off to your funders that you've made X number of contacts on LinkedIn. Much more likely is that you're going to use this as a tool when you're doing your stakeholder analysis to say, these are the people in these government departments or these NGOs or this <coughs> patient group or whatever that I know that I'm interested in or this particular um, uh, Royal College or whatever, it will then throw up the option for you to be able to make more connections with people there or use the existing networks that you have to grow your uh, understanding of other people. So, you know, analytics not great, but your, uh, uh, your bridging ability is, is really quite useful with it. Um, and this is the other thing. Right? Ma massive number. Right, so there's, I think it's 111,000 of people who are listed as alumni of, of Southampton. Um, now again, you know, maybe people don't respond, particularly if you reach out, but that's, that's a huge potential audience that you can tap into with your personal work, or with your, with your work and your particular research interest, but with your uh, uh, projects as well, right? Um, so um, being able to engage with uh, the corporate uh, comms people here at the university to say, here's something that I really would like you to be able to feature and work with them is a great way of being able to drive yourself out to a truly global audience of people who are already kind of warm to the institution. You know, they've, they've, they've had some of that horrible University of Southampton coffee. They've sat at desks like this and seen presentations like this, and, you know, and they kind of, they get it a bit. Um, those are all relationships that are potentially there to be able to be leveraged um, and, and you should consider how you can do that. Again, if you haven't got a LinkedIn profile and you're not putting regular content out there, then it's really hard to get going with that and try and get to that group. But if you're doing it on a regular basis, back to the, uh, the funnel of work, um, there, there's something there. Um, 
some of you will remember Bertha from your childhood. I don't know, there's not many people my age, so maybe not. Um, uh, so um, it's a professional tone. Like it's it's really kind of it's definitely being your uh, your best self and not your sassy self when you're on on uh, on LinkedIn. You're definitely looking at the potential for um, future employers or colleagues to be able to relate to. So um, you'll see colleagues that are using LinkedIn on a on a fairly regular basis. Like I would say like don't post more than once a week probably, or if you do like have a bit of a glut and then forget about it again for a while. Um, but hey, if you see colleagues or people that you know that are, that are doing this, like, share the love a bit, share that around, show the other people that these are people that you're connecting with and that, that you know. Um, and, uh, and yeah, don't, don't be overly fussed. It's not like twist where you're hitting that refresh button to see, see what's happening out there in the real world. Um, and then there's some stuff around your discoverability as well. So um, have a picture of you so that people know it's you. I know it's really basic, but um, this is... This is like it's uh, it's Facebook for work, right? So you need to be able to see your face, not a nice, lovely image of a, of a more abstract thing. So, um, so Instagram, right? Politicians are loving Instagram at the moment, and have been doing so for quite a while. I think that maybe it's just a little bit less vicious than Twitter can be, particularly if you're uh, an elected representative, where everyone kind of wants to rip shreds off of you. Um, Instagram is kind of, uh, you know, it's all, all about the focus of, uh, of image and moving image. Um, I would argue that to get the most out of Twitter, you want to be quite visually focused anyhow. Um, but uh, that means that there's a benefit of being able to share the same content that you're generating across more than one platform. Um, it's got some, you know, it's not just, just bunny ears and doing that weird snout thing that people are really keen on doing, but you can do other things like adding a bit of text into your stuff in a really clean and easy way that you can do this on the go directly from the app on your phone. Like, this is not super time consuming, but it's all lovely shareable content which will come out. And it's that shareable content which is really useful. What you want is to be able to talk to your followers, but for your followers to be able to share this around as being something which is of interest to you. And it's that way that you're much more likely to go back to that horrible group of, uh, of, uh, of staffers there or for people from, from NGOs or for uh, researchers for committees. Um, it's quite friendly. As I say, I, I think it's, it's more friendly than, than Twitter. So kind of, you know, if you're feeling really snarky, put that onto Twitter and keep that away from Instagram. Um, fairly regular uh, interactions as well, um, so much more on the on the Twitter side of things than on the on the LinkedIn side of things, um, and uh, and a bit of stuff about you, much more than you would do again on LinkedIn. But um, you know, um, it's quite a good platform to be able to say, oh, my research is not working in the way that I was expecting it to, and this is causing me headaches, and this is what I want to to talk to you about. Um, and useful for um, for being able to get recruitment for, for studies as well. Um, so um, vlogs, horrible, horrible word. It sort of flops out of your mouth, doesn't it? Um, like a video blog doesn't need to be with all of this wonderful equipment which is going on at the back of the room today, but it can just be having your phone propped up on a pile of books or in a you know in your in your cup, pointing back at you where you just hit the button and say for you know. 30 seconds, a minute, three minutes, whatever. Um, this is what's going on at the moment. Here's my little update. And you don't have to worry about all of the editing. It doesn't matter if the lighting's not great. And you know, as long as the, the, the sound is there, it's, a, it's an authentic uh, way of being able to engage with the people that are doing the science. And I think that that's really important to be able to get that across, that you're an indi individual that's doing this work and what it is that motivates you about this work. Um, content's lovely for being able to measure and see your reach as well. And I particularly say that for, uh, for Instagram and for Twitter, these are things that you do want to be reporting back to your funders, is uh, the, 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 the size of the, um, of the reach that you're getting from, from these. Um, and it's just a fun, engaging, and kind of sort of vaguely on trend for the last couple of years, so probably about to sink without a trace in the next two years. But you know, there you go, it's good to be getting into at this stage. Um, and it's dirt cheap because you're using all of this stuff already. You don't necessarily need to be generating that much more content. And I would argue that the content that you're using on Instagram, you should be using on Twitter as well. Um, so, as I said, I spend a lot of time with people's pathways to impact statements. Um, 
normally, you know, 48 hours before submission is about right for it to come to our office and say, hey, we're going to do some impact stuff and I uh, don't really know what it is, but uh, we need to do it, otherwise we're definitely not going to get the money, right? So what, what is this and what does it mean? Um, so I think the, the critical thing with is like, let's, let's be honest about the things that we can do and the things that we can't do. Like, you're not going to be... Uh, David Runciman's podcast, our name escapes me for the time being, um, Talking Politics. Like, it's, it's enormous. It's great uh, production quality. It's got ridiculous number of listens. It's incredibly popular as being one of these huge pieces of science engagement. It's like top quality radio for radio production out there into the world. Like, don't say that you're going to launch a podcast as part of your three-year project. But the possibility of that gaining traction and you being able to fill enough content for that during the course of three years is next to none. And the, the reality of you saying that you're going to, uh, to, to do that, when you're reading a Pathways to Impact Statement, or many, uh, as I do, it's just kind of scoffable, right? It kind of shows a complete naivety of, I've heard that podcasts are a thing, so I'm going to do podcasts, right? Mm, it just it doesn't, it doesn't fit. See how you can jump onto somebody else's bandwagon. How, you know, if you're saying that I want to get onto to Runciman's podcast, or there's an existing podcast at my university, or I'm going to get in contact with all in the mind or in our time or you know going to use contacts inside the BBC to go and do some stuff like that's real that's much more likely for you to be able to achieve that don't suddenly find that you're going to be be a podcaster um, <coughs> these things all take a bit of time um, so you should consider the cost of that time to your research project and have this as being part of somebody's full-time role, right? Not to just do this, but that this should be, you know, in their contracts that this is an area of responsibility that somebody should be doing. And if you're the PI, you know, you're going to want to have, as with all of the parts, some overview on that and a bit of engagement with that. And you're going to want to do a little bit of, you know, occasionally have someone come to you and say, <coughs> do a vlog, and then you're going to talk at them for a bit of time. But, um, but you want to ensure that one of your research assistants is doing this on a regular basis. Um, talking about having some, some legacy really makes your project extend beyond the time that you're asking for the money. And having digital artifacts is a great way of being able to generate legacy. So you've got some stuff which is going out into the world there and will continue to circulate even though the money is finished and you've moved on to the next project. That's really important for you to be able to say that this is the thing which is going to, to continue to, uh, to, to grow. Um, and, and again, with the, with the Pathways to Impact, what is it that you're looking to be able to actually do? So if you can talk, not that you're going to get, you know, I saw this recently, X number of followers. Like, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter about the number of people. It's what it is that they're going to do for you and for your project. So you should be looking at being able to say that you're going to, you know, you're going to look to follow people who are working in this particular department and you're going to do that by being able to understand what's going on in terms of that department and the stuff that they're pushing out from there. What is it that you want to get to from this and think about that and then work backwards to you know, uh, how you're going to reach out to these people and what platform you're going to use. Um, and, uh, and what what seems feasible for, for the platforms that you've got. Social media is not the panacea to all of, your, all of your things. Ultimately, this is a law to be able to get you to sit down in front of somebody who has the levers at their disposal to make the change that your research indicates should happen. Um, and those people are going to have loads of people like you coming at them from different angles, all of them looking to be able to push their particular thing about what's, what's important. And some of that will be the politics, some of that will be the money, some of that will be other evidence that are coming in a different way. This is just about you trying to get your foot in the door. In and of itself, it isn't going to make the difference. Um, unless we go back to that very first slide of Trump seeing something on Twitter and reacting. But you know, those, those aren't the policy makers that we want to engage with. Right? Um, and then, yeah, uh, going back to the don't reinvent the wheel, like, look to be able to leverage existing relationships that you, that you can. Um, so LinkedIn, look to be able to use the university profile. Um, if you're doing Twitter stuff, then um, so we've got, I don't know, maybe it's 200 university researchers' personal accounts that we've just bumped across over time and collected and put into a list. So look to be able to utilise things that are out there already to be able to, to do this and not do it all, all for yourself. So um, I was expecting more of a laugh, <coughs> but clearly I've, I've worn you out. 
Um, so um, like there, there is, uh, thank you, <laughs> um, there, there is help available. Um, so uh, Hootsuite is a thing uh, which, uh, which really knows far, far, far too much about, but like, it's a great tool. Basically, you put your content in, in, a, in a lovely box like this, and then up here, you just add all of the social networks that you're a member of already. So you can post to your uh, LinkedIn account, and you can post to your Facebook account, and your Facebook page account, and to your YouTube account, uh, to all of, all of the social media accounts via Hootsuite. Um, and it means that you can have your RA spend a bit of time you know, on a, on a Monday thinking about things that are going to be happening. Um, let's schedule all of the tweets for the week, or the fortnight, or the month. Um, and you can choose some frequency. So we find that between in, for, for audience in the UK, between 12 and 2 is the time that we get the most number of retweets Monday to Friday, because it's lunchtime and people are having a bit of a flick, flick through Twitter on their phone. Um, we also find that uh, it bounces up loads on a, on a Sunday afternoon as well. Um, there you go. Um, so you'll start to see patterns of when things start to get a bit of an interaction. Remember that you don't want to just be like, machine-like, <coughs> doling out the same stuff at the same time, because people will get real, they'll see that and they'll, they'll, they'll get bored of that pretty quickly. So mix up the times that things are going out, but think more about the kind of the frequency. Is this, is this message a twice a week, or is this a three times a week, or is this daily and we really want to drive this for a set period of time to you know, get people to come to your event, or something like that. It's a great tool. Um, it's, it's worth paying for, but also you don't have to. So um, if you imagine on the, on the page, the, the, the bottom of the page is kind of here. And if you just scroll that little bit more, you can get probably everything that you need for your research project for, for free. Or you could pay <coughs> £16 a month. The, it's the number of, um, uh, of, of profiles and the number of, of scheduled messages. So it becomes a bit laborious if you need to, because as each message, schedule message goes out, you then get your counter going back up again. So like, you need to get a bit more person time uh, to, to focus on doing it for the free account. But again, like, if you're putting in how you're going to, uh, in your pathways to impact statement, how you're going to get your message out there, do some public engagement, and do some potential policy engagement, this is the kind of cost which shows that you've really thought about how it is that you're going to do the nuts and bolts of that process of engagement. And this is the kind of cost that you really should be pushing to, um, uh, to funders to say, this is the, these are the tools that I need to be able to do my job. Um, the support from, uh, from the design center here. Um, so they will work with you for infographics, um, for a bit of uh, data visualization as well. Um, layouting for your uh, for, for printed matter, um, and they'll also go off and do some stuff to find some lovely uh, uh, images for you as well. Um, they're super cheap. They're much cheaper than going to an external provider for this kind of work, and they're part of the university. So you give them a sub project code, and you can get in contact with them. And they're, they're you know they're really good. Can't recommend them highly enough. The email address is up, is on there, and I'll, I'll circulate these slides around. Um, and here's just a, an example of a project that we were working on last year. So finding some, uh, well actually they went and took those images of happy smiley children um, and then this big thing of lovely uh, infographics to be able to summarise the stuff. So like, they're, they're really good at being able to work with, with the PI to be able to develop the, the products. Um, there's us, public policy. Um, so we do this stuff all of the time. Um, if you are writing a pathways to impact statement and uh, and you know the clock's ticking, but you do think that oh, we need to do some policy stuff, email us. We will respond quickly. We're used to responding quickly. Don't be put off when you think there's only a few hours before I'm supposed to be submitting this. We'll we'll go through and, and help you with that. We're listed as a research facility, so you can cost us into your process. Um, I don't have good numbers on on whether us being costed in makes it more likely that you're going to get funding, but uh, we certainly think that we can drive uh, a significant amount of value out of the relationships that we already have to be able to support your project um, and to be able to establish new relationships where those don't exist at the moment. Um, you can follow our Twitter account. Um, there are lists in there uh, of all sorts of people that are kind of interest. Uh, they're all open. You can go and grab those people and start to follow them, and that can sort of get you going. 
Um, and uh, there was a slight bitterness in my voice and I was saying, like, don't just start doing a podcast because it's really hard. But I know because I'm doing that at the moment and it's really hard. Um, so uh, come on our podcast and let us do the hard work for you while we do all of the amplification process of getting this out there uh, to, to keep people using our existing channels. Um, but also do all of the editing stuff and you know the recording stuff and find a time and a room and all of those kind of things. Um, so you, use the support that's available. Um, and then uh, just a little bit of stuff to to round off with um, in regards to you know who who are you telling and what is it that you're telling them about whether this has been an effective use of time. Um, so we I came across this thing. Dr. Sweetie a while ago. What it does is it, uh, Twitter is lovely at keeping all of your stuff in one place, which is grand if you want to use it in the way that it wants you to use it. But sometimes it's really nice to know all of your followers in a you know, nice, reliable Excel spreadsheet where you can have a look at all of the people that they follow, well, the numbers of all of the people that they follow, whereabouts in the world they are, what, um, uh, so you can tell when the best time is to be able to schedule tweets to get to those particular people. Um, Dr. Sweetie, you know, sucks all of that information out for a price and spits it out into, into a spreadsheet. Um, we find it really useful. It gives you some stuff like this um, and gives you a bit of a, an idea about who the, who the people are and, and what they're about. There's more to this. It scrolls <coughs> and scrolls, but that's, a, that's the most important thing. Um, Twitter Analytics is, uh, is, is provided for free by Twitter. Um, these are it's very unusual since Irina took over doing the com stuff for us to have red numbers here, but they'll, they'll change and turn into green ones, I'm sure, by the end of the, end of the month. But um, this will give you information about, in a, in a nice sort of heads up way, what's, what's working uh, for you particularly at that during the course of this month. Um, and then you can uh, export uh, this stuff about your most popular uh, tweets, which will give you some stuff that looks a bit like this. Um, but spending a bit of time with these you can kind of have a look at what what the key features are that are, that are coming out so you know um, number of people that you're following against um, just kind of seeing what's working and particularly like when it's working is really quite quite useful um, and then you can do some, some nice coarsely summaries and see see what's good and what's bad um, this kind of stuff some nice solid data to be able to say these are the these are the, not just the, the total number of people that are following, but these are the kind of areas of interest that they have, and uh, these are where they are in the world, and this is how many times people are interacting with our tweets on this particular message. It's some um, good, solid, quantifiable data. Um, and we've come to the end. Um, so I've, I've talked at you for ages there, at quite a speed. Um, this, this session is always kind of difficult to, to plan for because sometimes people want help with how do I set up my biography and other people want to know more detailed stuff about how do I get to the right kind of people. But um, now's a good time to take some questions if anyone has some as well. Just a quick question. Sure. Uh, you didn't mention research gate here. Yeah, no, I didn't. Um, so, well, I, I'm, I say it quietly, I'm not an academic. Um, so, uh, so I don't have a ResearchGate profile, so I haven't had any engagement with it, so I didn't feel uh, uh, confident in being able to talk about how, how effective that, that is or, or isn't for people. Um, no. hey. um, what's the point of a hashtag? Oh, so it, um, uh, it binds things together. Um, so uh, if you... Uh, so for, for, for your event, right, uh, you, you've got a hashtag for your event. It means that when people want to talk about that event, they include the hashtag, then people can search for the hashtag and see all of the comments made on that, on that hashtag. Um, and hashtags work in um, uh, Instagram and, uh, and Twitter. Um, not across platforms, but in, in, inside that platform. Um, so it's a nice way of kind of bundling things together. So... Um, and if you're doing multiple uh, themes of things, so there was a, I'm not sure if we still do it for this, but for um, uh, uh, for the policy training sessions, we just used to have that as a hashtag, and then that means that when someone searches for that, they can see all of the, the training sessions that have happened and all of the comments that have happened on those. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a piece of string to tie together all the messages. 
Hey. For the uh, Twitter analytics. Yeah, yeah. Were a lot of those available free of charge? Yes, yeah. So you yeah, need yeah. to pay for, pay for one, one of the... So you need to pay for, <coughs> for Dr. Tweety. There, I think that there are probably other equivalents. I just sort of had a bit of a search around and found that one, and there was no limit on the total number of accounts that you can, um, uh, that you can suck out if you pay like, this nominal fee, like maybe like 10 euro or something like that. I don't know. But real like uh, bargain base basement prices. Um, others you can get for free, but maybe you can only export like 300 followers' information at any one time. Um, I don't know, we're like at nearly 3,000 or something like that, so it's, it's just, yeah, it's going to be arduous uh, uh, to do it that way for free. Um, and then Twitter Analytics is something that's provided by Twitter, um, and that will export all of the data based on your tweets, but not on your followers. Um, so you kind of want a, a mixture of the two to know about your audience um, and, and also about your content. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the policy pod? Yes, yes, I can. Right, so it's new-ish. Oh. Right, so um, so we we ran it as a as a pilot last year, um, and there's there's been quite a lot of interest from academics. So who have we had so far? Um, uh, Wendy Hall. Uh, we had uh, we had one session. So this was a real um, interesting. Uh, the the very first one was uh, an event at. Uh, God's House Tower, does anyone know this in Southampton? It's right down by the, where the platform pub is, where the, right at the, where the water's edge used to be. Um, and uh, it was with uh, some artsy people, so a uh, leader of, um, of an art development um, uh, thing in Southampton, uh, the uh, community's uh, cabinet uh, uh, elected representative for Southampton. Um, and then uh, a chap in um, uh, music who had written a, a thing called a cultural manifesto, which sounds like terrible, doesn't it? But um, actually wasn't at all. It was much more about, um, so we've got this new arts uh, 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 centre in Southampton. What's it for? It's for the people of Southampton. What, does, what do the people of Southampton actually want? And being able to put in proce uh, a process for, for engaging with that. Anyway, it was uh, we did it in January, and uh, I was having a dry, dry January, but did have loads of booze left in the house and cheese. So I brought this down, and uh, and we had loads of wine, and we had loads of cheese, and it was a raucous and wide-ranging conversation. I wouldn't recommend including wine in podcast materials, and haven't done that since. But um, so that was kind of one which was really wide-ranging, talking around how this uh, research was being supportive in uh, shaping understanding from uh, Southampton City's point of view about how to use this. Um, Material. Um, Wendy's one was much more of uh, a kind of retrospective of, a retrospective of her uh, her career, um, particularly with her report on uh, the the AI uh, commission being the, the centerpiece for that. And then we've done a couple of things where it's been roundtable conversations. Um, so I would say we are experimenting with format at the moment. Um, we host it on. SoundCloud um, and we push it out via Twitter and it goes out in the newsletter to the public policy membership as well. Um, but we're thinking of ways where we can drive up the listens at the moment um, and, uh, and certainly the, uh, the university LinkedIn profile is one of the places where we think this is a, a good point to, uh, to, to, to push out our message from. Hmm. Um, there was another one, yeah. Um, with Hootsuite, does, do you still need to tailor the message for each channel? Because you're saying, so like, yeah, your tone, yeah, yeah. It should be different. On the so, so definitely, your, you know, your, your tone. You don't. Right, you don't I'd, I'd hate for you to go away with the opinion that you should always be snarky all of the time on Twitter. So. Um, but you know, maybe you want to be a bit. But um, I, I would guess that the messages that you're scheduling are going to be some things which are slightly <coughs> more standard, of which you can set some of those things. And you say, well, this is kind of in the more personal thing, so I'm going to do this one to go to LinkedIn and this one to go to Instagram. Whereas there's going to be some regular stuff that's going to go to all three of those channels. Um, so you can you can tailor your message to which cluster. Of, uh, uh, of things you think are the, are the right thing to go for. Um, and as I say, you can send out those messages going out at the same time, but to slightly different content going to each of those different uh, uh, platforms. So you've got quite a lot of flexibility inside Hootsuite to, to tailor that message. The only, annoy well, the only annoying thing, you have to pay for it, which is a bit frustrating, but um, 
one of the uh, slightly irritating things is that you can't do the tagging of people in uh, inside Hootsuite. So you have to do that as a, as a native uh, Twitter thing. That's something that we came across a little while ago. Um, so that, that limits a little bit of functionality there. Yeah. yeah. Are there any um, uh, programs that you can use to analyze the responses of people? So from, um, from the Twitter analytics, um, you get feedback there about responses that you've got. I don't, so that will give you like hard numbers of responses that have been made to those particular messages. But I don't know if it includes, from the top of my head, whether it includes the actual content of what the response is. Um, yeah, so not, not certain about that. But clearly, that would be really useful for you to be able to, to understand a bit of what it what comes from. Whether any of them include sentiment analysis. Yeah, yeah. There may be something out there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the dark art of sentiment analysis. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I picked up that uh, Twitter is often used by journalists to, to take a look at what's around. Mm -hmm. how, how much do we make use of that? Do you think? Well, I think that that's that's kind of this thing of making yourself appear bigger, right? You know, if you're um, if you're following uh, mm -hmm. uh, journalists, then you're 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 likely in their professional mind to say, well, here's someone with a, you know, a w w Professor X or a Dr. Y or whatever. That's probably a person that's worth me following as well. In which case, suddenly you're in their, their sphere of stuff which is being fed to them. Again, if you start pushing out things on a fairly regular basis, then that's great. Um, the, the, you can also have that, that direct line uh, to, to, the, to the other people that you're following as well. So if they follow you and you follow them, then you can directly message between the two of you. And um, that, that can really boost your, your prominence of getting access in. Um, so journalists are a great way of being able to amplify, and this is a great way of you getting in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any more for any more? Yeah. Also, along those lines of responses, I mean, I'm doing some research around this at the moment because on the website. <laughs> And what you potentially can do, because I'm looking at other people doing it, is I think ethically we have to identify who we are. Mm. But when people have the conversations about uh, issues, for example, I've been looking at sort of media articles, by getting in earlier, early and repeating your own messages, that can be fairly influential as well. Mm -hmm. So there's another way to do it that sort of sits out the main, just using the sort of Twitter and Facebook approaches. Um, yeah, and. And certainly, so there's um, there's been some analysis of um, of comments. Uh, so particularly on on YouTube channel uh, stuff, where people are, are feeding in uh, their, their their thoughts to that, it you know th there's a space there to be able to have some kind of dialogue. Um, again, I'm not sure how you pull that out and how you do the measuring of that. Um, you know, maybe you're just into a world of doing lots of screenshots to be able to capture that. Mm, don't know. Um, but yeah, there's, there's there's a space here to be able to, to engage with with an audience that perhaps you wouldn't be able to, to get to otherwise. Yeah, because some of the research I've read said that the opinion forms in, in the comment sections can be more influential than the people who've actually written the article. <laughs> so that is quite a lot of influence you could have if you have those conversations in the comment section. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the cynic in me says, you know, how much of those are, uh, are, are bots that are just uh, going off and, and uh, yeah, and responding to keywords and doing yeah, but um, but yeah, certainly. There's, there's influence to, to be had there. Um, but uh, uh, again, I think, um, so maybe there's, there's interest for, for your research. For, for me in particular, it's how you get to do that thing of nudging the, uh, the, the policy maker. Um, and there you want to be able to, to step back to think about who the, uh, who the people are that are feeding in the information to the policy maker and then try and get as many of those to be aware of your work and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and passing on your, your messages. Um, that's kind of the, the key thing that you can look to achieve from this. Um, last, last gasp for any questions. No. Cool. So I think, um, yeah, look, there's a whole 25 minutes back in your day that you thought that you weren't going to have, but that you do. <coughs> um, and, uh, and as I said, um, this is uh, this is awesome, and as you can see, well, well thumbed from our from our team. Um, but this is the sort of thing that you should be putting on your list of uh, things to do. Um, so, um, well, Emily, Mo uh, Sierra Williams is the person that I'm sort of most aware of. But um, yeah, I'll take a take a snap.
you know, sometimes it's a bit annoying to ask a question in front of a, a room full of people, but um, we, we, we work with people from, from all faculties. Feel free to drop us a line or go for a cup of coffee or talk about what your plan is for your particular uh, social media engagement strategy or, or whatever. We're, we're always happy to drink terrible university coffee with somebody. So, yeah. cool. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.